You can call me Dick. Scott, the countdown's over on the on a uh, Facebook. We're going to just let it hang there and see who notices in the audience. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> These birds are so beautiful. They have a six foot wingspan. Jeez. Yeah. Incredible. Well, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, Scott Roberts from the Explore Alliance and Explore Scientific. And this is our episode four of On the Wing with Dan George and Kent Martz. And um, I guess our topic this, uh, this week is colors. That's correct. Let me get things set up here. Dan, how you been? Fantastic. Good. We're, we're, we're dodging uh, thunderstorms here in the Denver area, but it's, as you know, these clouds are awesome. Oh, yeah, that's true. And the birds yeah. don't really care. Birds don't care? Yeah. No, not at all. You know, I've seen like major storms and stuff where you, you see, I mean, we get severe uh, weather, uh, you know, in, in Colorado and Arkansas and, you know, and especially when you get like through Tornado Alley. And I was really curious how birds deal with that, you know, or massive hurricanes. How, how do how do birds deal with it? They, I mean, are they do they abandon their nest and just fly away and escape or what what, what, do, what do you think happens, Dan? Well, first of all, they're blown away. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, normally, they'll take shelter in trees or bushes. Uh, uh -huh. And if, if that, if, 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 if like a tornado comes through, uh, you'll have thousands of birds that probably die. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was reading today, and I, I want to work on an episode on, uh, we talked about a little bit about the migration of birds and how it happens at night. And they have been working on artificial intelligence to, to uh, uh, based on 20 years of radar data to predict gigantic bird migrations in the United States. 
and they estimate that a, a, up to a billion birds die every year because of building strikes in the United States. Building strikes? Wow. Yeah. Caused by billion? light. Huh, sir? A billion birds. A billion birds. Wow, that's sad. It's staggering. So, anyway, here we go. If I can... I'll get this all some sound on this one day. Anyway, here we go. Um, the red breasted nuthatch. Uh, for some reason, the sound is not there. Huh. Well, we're going to have to go without the red breasted nuthatch. Let me look real quick. This is weird. This little guy is about four and a half, four and a half inches long. And there's actually, uh, it's actually seen in virtually all 49 states in North America. Hmm. And the thing about this bird, when you see it, is that really strong black uh, line through the eye. That's that's the real identific identifier of that, and the gray and the gray back. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times you see them hanging upside down, walking down tree trunks. Um, they have they they have the ability to walk down tree trunks and and hang upside yeah. down. They're quite the uh, uh, tightrope walker, if you will. You know, an acrobat. They look for in they look for insects on trees, and I don't think gravity has anything to do to affect them much. But they are also a great bird. For pe people that have bird feeders in the backyard, seed feeders, they're also pretty active with seed feeders. Yeah. So I'll have to get the sound for next week and we'll I'll reinsert this slide in next week so we can hear that sound. I'm sorry about that. So let's go to the rose breasted gross beak. We've seen this bird in, in pictures on show one. Such a beautiful, beautiful bird. Hang on a second. Here we go. There we go. Notice it sounds similar to a robin. They're called a um, The, the, the species is called basically a gross beak, and there are there are um, about seven different gross beaks in North America. The gross beak, I think, is derived from German because the word for great or large is, gro is uh, gross. So, so that, gross beak, large beak. This had a, gra a sign that the graphic came up on that video that said the gross beak has been referred to as the robin that took singing lessons. <laughs> oh, cheers to that listener. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a, it's not a listener. It was on the video that's with the sound. And as you can now, see, if you, go ahead. If you were to see, if you were to see his mate, the female, you would not find rose colored on any part of the body. It's only the male. Which is typical of many, many birds, but then we see eagles and you know other birds and, and i know there's a term for it I can't remember what it is well we we i believe we talked about this last week the word is monomorphic there you monomorphic go monomorphic is like uh, you know most of your uh, like a starling for example they all look alike whether they're male or female so they're all monomorphic so uh, that's, and so in those cases you you cannot tell the sexes but in the virtually all other birds most uh, most birds basically um, have that derivative. So looking at the the, the migration map and the breeding map, um, you know, uh, here in Northwest Arkansas, uh, we're in the migration. So they fly through and they disappear. Although I suspect because we're so close to the range in Missouri where they're breeding, there probably are some 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 uh, breeding pairs here. What I find interesting is you look over here in the Appalachians going down into Georgia and the Carolinas and Virginia, uh, there's a, this weird finger that sticks down, I suspect is probably temperature related potentially. Why do you think would cause that, Dan? 
it's usually, well, it could be temperature, it could be food, it could be shelter. Um, and, and, and also the unanswered question is what else would cause the gross beak to actually um, mate when, in that pink or whatever color that is, that means they're, they're, um, they're having their babes there. Right. And the yellow, they're basically migrating through until they get to their mating area. It's just a weird shape that just strikes me as odd. And, and again, for, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say for anybody to see a rose breasted gross beak, consider yourself really lucky. It's one of the most spectacular birds in North America. And they're big birds too. They are not small by any means. They're eight inches. They're eight inches from uh, bill to tail. So just a little bit smaller than a redheaded woodpecker then. Yeah, I, yeah, a little bit, right. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't want to choose between the two. They're both marvelous though, you know? So here we go, uh, the great blue heron. Now, these are big birds, as you said. They got a six foot wingspan. Um, they stand about 46 inches tall, an, an adult. And uh, when it comes to identifying birds, you, you really just look at how big it is and what color it is, and you'll know that it's a, it's a great blue heron because of its size. You know, and, and, I, for, and people, I think for people that are maybe beginning birders or maybe uh, mid, mid range birders, the difference between a heron and an egret. When you say, if you take a look at a, a, a great egret or a white egret to a, to a heron, you say, well, why is, I mean, they have the same characteristics. They look the same. Typically um, egrets are going to be white. So there you go. You know, black crowned night heron, great blue heron, little blue heron. They're colorful. Egrets pretty much are all white. Isn't that interesting? You know, mm -hmm. I, I look at this and, and the colors when you see one in, when in the in good light is just spectacular. I like that black shoulder patch and uh, the colors in the bill and uh, behind the eye. And when I see a, a great blue heron, I think of a grumpy old man just the, just <laughs> yeah. because of the look at it. It just looks like a grumpy old man. They don't look they never I, look happy. I love seeing them standing in water, you know, yeah. and they're so still you know, as they're fishing or whatever they're doing. And um, uh, just, uh, I think it's an elegant bird for how big it is, you know. And, and, when, and when it takes flight, it's magnificent. It takes a few flaps to get up. And when they fly, it's like a B-52. Real yeah. slow, move, slow moving wing. They drag their two and a half foot long feet behind their tail. There's the sound of the hair. Listen to that. Rawr. Sounds like somebody choking a dog. And <laughs> <laughs> um, they're pretty much everywhere in North America. Uh, yep. You don't see them very often in high in high elevations, but they're pretty much everywhere in in, uh, in North America, including Canada, and also uh, also um, Alaska. So, uh, uh, you know, they're always generally almost always around water. I don't know if I've ever seen one out in the middle of a field just chilling. There's always got going to be water nearby because that's where they feed. That's that's their habitat. They'll yeah. never come to your feeder in the backyard. I can tell you that they are not seed eaters. However, no. I, I do know I had a, a gentleman who since since uh, died. Um, he had uh, some uh, uh, koi ponds in his backyard. Oh and, boy. Uh, and let's just say he quit they clean putting, that up, huh? He quit, yeah. <laughs> they they quit putting koi in, and then he started putting in uh, uh, just goldfish. And they started making these uh, giant tents out of chicken wire over them yeah. and, fi and finally came up with enough of a design that uh, he started putting koi back in his fish ponds. And then the raccoons forget how to get in. So he went, oh, back, to gold so he went yeah. back to goldfish again because the herons were, were 
Very he's, he's good. Like a steel plate over the oh, pond to yeah. keep the raccoons out. Yeah. yeah. And he really loved, I mean, they weren't big, you know, they're twice or three times the size of, size of an office desk and, you know, a couple of feet deep. And he would dig the, dig them out himself and then put a, a plastic pond liner in and put rocks around it and have flowers and, and lily pads. And they were just beautiful. And you'd see these koi and they'd come up. And then one day you got to feed them and they wouldn't come up. And uh, because they weren't, they, they'd gone down the gullet of a heron. Uh, so, you know, uh, like anything else, you know, all animals are hungry and they're going to eat the easiest meals they can eat. Um, I, I, I don't know if he ever caused one to perish with rapid onset lead poisoning. He never said he did, but, uh, you know, he, he, he may have violated federal law by whacking one or two of them. Uh, but, you know, that's dramatic steps. Uh, there we go. So now the beautiful red-winged blackbird. Here we go. Now this bird, yeah, listen to this call. I've heard that before. Now, a lot of birds, like for example, a chickadee makes a chick, chick, chickadee sound. So therefore they're called chickadees, right? A lot of birds can be identified by the sounds that they make and a red-winged blackbird makes a conqueree, conqueree when they air, conqueree. And when you hear that sound, it's only the it's only the red winged blackbird, and it's only the male. You can hear more in the background if you listen carefully. There's some, I hear some ducks and some probably uh, Canada geese back there too. Yep. Warblers back there too. But you'll never, you rarely will see red winged blackbirds anywhere where there isn't any water. They're found in ponds and marshes and lakes and trees by the water and so forth. So almost always. There, there's, oh, wow. uh, yeah, there's seven blackbird species in North America. What are the other ones, Dan? Uh, the other, there's, there's one called a, there's one called a. Uh, I know there's a tri-wing. Um, well, there, Oops. Not sure off the top of my head, I can't think of the other. This is the, obviously the most, this is the most, um, most popular one because it's seen everywhere. The other ones you'd have to go to places where they have their habitat specific to their, uh, to their right. location. I know there's a tri-wing blackbird that I've seen before. Um, I can't think of any other. Well, there, in fact, there. there's one called a yellow headed blackbird that's found in the mountains, at mountain states, basically and parts of the um, West Central uh, states. And they literally are, are a black bird with a yellow head, spectacular. So like two birds, the head stuck from a different bird stuck on a black bird, just like a bald eagle, dramatic change like a bald eagle has? Yeah. Okay. It's a spectacular bird and they're, they're ubiquitous. They're, plus they're everywhere in the United States. How does that sound? There we go. But just a beautiful bird. And the sound is obvious as can be when you hear it. Um, or there is nothing like it. All right, so moving on. Now, here's one that I don't think I've ever seen before. Uh, although well, they're here all the time. It's a common yellow throat. Hmm. Do you have the sound of that? I do. Here we go. Hmm. I would imagine when they're video, 
making videos of these birds, they must have some sort of like dish with a, a microphone that can pick up sound from far away. And it's kind of hard to filter out the bird sounds behind it as well, or in front of it, actually. Hmm. This bird now makes a, when I'm talking about a chickadee that will do a chickadee sound, or the red-winged blackbird will do conkaree. Uh, this particular bird is really easy to find if you're listening for it because it goes witchity, witchity, witchity. It, and I can't, if you could play that again, it was there. He did it like two and a half times. Witchity, witchity, witchity. That, like there that. Comes. In every case, it's going to be a common yellow throat. Okay. With a higher pitch than I am, I'm a baritone, so it's probably a more like a soprano or something like that. But uh, this is only, they're only five inches long and they are always near, uh, near water. Always near water. Are they monomorphic or? Uh, well, with respect to, to making the calls, the, only the male makes the calls. But, you know, that's a good question, Kent. Uh, I could look at my book while we're sitting here. I could probably get back at, and let you know. But, just, um, yeah. yeah, from an from identification standpoint, they're known to have the black mask. And it is a black. It's just, it's just like the, you know, what was that? Uh, that the wild, uh, what was it? Uh, Lone Ranger? Yeah, yeah, thank you for helping me. I got yep. this senility working really good for you today. But anyway, um, yeah, that's... Uh, it's just, I'm fun to listen to all the birds. All right, so moving on. And we're going to go to... Come on. Here's the witch do again. Yep. We're going to go to the red-tailed hawk, which uh, Terry Stanfield identified as a, with odd coloration, and this is an oddly colored red-tailed hawk. Dan, do you think it is a red-tailed hawk? Well, I can tell you there's two things. Actually, uh, this is a very unusual picture of a red-tailed hawk. Normally, you'd see them either sitting on the top of a tree or a branch or flying, but this points out one thing that's really just really important to know that um, the red tail can only be seen from the top. So usually when you see, usually when you're going to see a hawk, they're going to be flying. And so when you're looking up, and these are these are birds that do a lot of soaring. When you're looking up at a red tail hawk, you do not see a red tail unless you were flying on top of the on top of the hawk, and then you would notice that the tail is actually red. Now, how about that? Hmm. And another thing too, this is the most common hawk in North America. They're, they're in all 49 states in North America. If you take a look and, and not, and it just kind of squint a little bit on, the, on its backside, you'll see that the white feathering almost, almost makes a V shape. Hmm. So right. you, can come, you can come on the backside of a red tail hawk and let's say the tail is, is obscured by the other by the wings, for example. But you could take a look at the back of that and you'll see a whitish V. And you will say, I learned from Dan George that that is a red tail hawk, even if I don't see the red tail. Hmm. And then another thing about this hawk, I mean, there's you know, there's so many nuances about bird watching as a as a hobby. But if you were looking at the front of this, unfortunately, we don't have a picture here to show you, but if you were to look at, take a look at the bird on the front, you could look at 10 of them and they all look different, but there's one thing they all have in common from the front perspective. And that is down towards, not the neck, but down towards the breast area, you have modeling, heavy modeling. Like if you might have a whitish background, but the modeling is in a dark brown, light brown or black. It's in every red tail yeah. hawk, so you, you can, can identify. Or you can red. You can identify the red tail hawk from the front or the back or in flight. You can see it in the video of the bird, uh, which has a picture of a red tail hawk from the front, and has a that you know white breast with the uh, uh, modeling uh, down about the bottom of the breast where the uh, the legs come in. So uh, that is exactly what it describes. So let's listen to this.
It's like a descending keel. And it's the only thing that makes that noise. I, I suppose there's many small animals that that's the last sound they ever hear. That's, <laughs> you are so right, Scott. Well, but I think right, right before they hear that, then the next time they hear is the rushing of wind through wings and then a sudden thump. <laughs> Mike uh, Wiesner says he sees lots of red-tailed hawks hovering around our land in Arizona. Actually, Mike lives near the, uh, 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 some of the, the great uh, riparian um, um, you know, birding sites in southern Arizona. Uh, when I visited Karchner Caverns, there was a ton of birders out there, and apparently they have all kinds of wonderful birds um, and lots of expert birders out there to observe them. They have a Harris hawk. Uh, man, I, you know, Kent, if we could do that in another, another week or two, get a picture of a, of a Harris hawk. It's got to be one of the coolest looking hawks. It's so uh, yeah. great. And usually you'll see them in Arizona and Frequently, you'll see them carrying a rattlesnake as they're flying back to their nest. So, Wiesner's job is to get us a Harris Hawk photo with one of his telescopes. With a snake on it. And I'll take I'll, with the snake, yeah. I'll take a picture of it sitting there on a hay bale or a cactus or something. I, I'm not picky. You know, and again, this points out, everybody listen, if you've got good pictures of birds, send them to me. Explore yeah. Alliance at explorescientific.com. Yeah, gotta put that up in the chat. I already did. We want yep. to, we want your pictures. Uh, because hey, earlier, earlier Kent asked me about the uh, the uh, common yellow throat, whether they're uh, monomorphic or not. Well, the female does not have a black mask, so I guess they're not monomorphic. Does she have a? Is she yellow otherwise? She's kind of a yellowish green, like any other female passerine. Okay, know? just. Nondescript, sort of yellow brown bird. That's exactly right. But you'll find it near marshes right by the male. Yeah. Well, where there are males, there are females, or the other way around, potentially. <laughs> so, all right, but just a beautiful picture, Cherry. Got a, you know, a hawk sitting on a recently baled hay. Um, you know, uh, around here, there's a lot of hay production and uh, both. Uh, you know, draws a lot of the cut hay, draws a whole lot of uh, uh, mice. Rats. Mice. Well, yeah. And so what happens is uh, when the mower goes through, and, and, and I had cows for 12 years and cut hay, when the mower goes through, uh, there's a lot of carcasses laying around and a lot of the vultures and uh, some hawks come in, but generally it's the vultures that come in. And then after the hay's gone or hay's been bailed up, you'll see hawks sitting on bales of hay, scanning that low cut field for movement. And all of a sudden you'll see one of them just take off like a, like a heat seeking missile and uh, hit the ground hard and then it come up and fly back to the nest. Or uh, if it's past nesting season, they, and I've watched this happen, they'll fly back and land on the same bale of hay and sit there and have their snack and then go back onto a patrol of, of eyeballing that 20 or 30 acres or whatever it is. So uh, very fascinating to sit there and watch. Now the, the common, I mean, the, the, the normal size of a red-tailed hawk is about 22 inches tall. Okay? Yeah. And they have a wingspan of 50 inches. 50. Oh, man. 50. That's four. <laughs> they could fly. Yeah. All right, so going on. So here's here's the bird nest watch, okay? So this is this picture is June. This is an American robin nest uh, out by the, in front of the office in a in a in a maple tree that's probably six inches in diameter. In front uh, of this office? Yeah, it's right next to my pickup truck, Scott. Oh, I thought yeah, this was near your home. So. No, this is out in the parking lot, right by oh, where wow. I park every day. And you have to check it out. That's yeah. cool. So you can't really. It's it's above my head. I can reach up and hold the camera above it. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is June 24th, uh, the day that all three eggs had hatched. And so as you can see, there's just, they're covered in little downy feathers and their eyes are these uh -huh. giant black orbs that are, you know, a quarter the size of their heads. Hmm. And so uh, this is June 29th. Mm -hmm. okay. Jeez. 
These things are growing fast. Yeah. Notice how the nest is somewhat full, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and they've developed bright yellow beaks. Uh -huh. uh, their down has turned into pin feathers. Um, and uh, when mom was up there when I pulled in and um, she uh, flew off that she had been feeding them. And when I stuck the camera up there, they, they didn't make any peeping sounds, but they opened their beaks a couple of times and they yeah. went, no, that's not mom. And just sort of suck back into the nest. And so, um, and right. so here is. And that's and, mom. huh? And this is mom. And this is a, a, a mom who is, uh, how shall we say, displeased with me. Mm-hmm. So that's her. It's Did a she dive bomb you or anything? No, she has not done that. If it was a mockingbird nest, I would have had hairs pulled out of my head. But yeah. it's not a mockingbird nest. It's just a robin's nest. And, you know, that's a robin sound. But I hear it as Dan and, and, you know, it sounds much more urgent and angry. And I'm really surprised that, you know, th there must not be any other robin's nest around because I would think that that would be a call to arms, if you will, for the other birds. I may be mistaken, totally uninformed about it, but it seems like that emergency sound would bring at least the mate to try and drive off the me. <laughs> Norm Hughes what? says she's saying, get, get, get. That's what she's saying, all right. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody uh, probably outside of places like Florida or California probably are hearing the sounds of robins right now like every night I, I hear that same sound. Everyone sounds identical. Um, and uh, they also have an interesting flute sound when they're, when they're mating actually. But this is a sound that, that, that the adult will make. And then if, if a fledged robin is on the ground somewhere, which happens frequently, the, 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 the juvenile will actually make a little sound that it's not even recorded in, as far as I know anyway. And they, they communicate with each other. So the little, the little one will make the noise. And then all of a sudden, the adult will, will make the noise that we just heard on, on Kent's uh, video here. And they find each other. And the, and the adult brings typically a worm from the lawns or insects or whatever. So it's, it's just fun to, at this time of year to, to watch and listen to nature around your house. Yeah. And uh... I can tell you a quick little story that I got, I have, I'm blessed with nine grandchildren. Now there are now they're all in their twenties and a couple are in their thirties. But when I was, you know, I guess when they were maybe like seven or eight or nine, they'd say, "Grandpa, what is your favorite bird?" And I said, "Well, let me think about that." This is before I hadn't thought about it. So after I thought about it, I thought, you know, it's called the American Robin because they have the most beautiful song. It really is unique to them, of course. And all of the other behavioral things that we talk about with the robin, it also it brings spring usually, mm -hmm. and they usually have two or three clutches, so they can have more than you know more than one set of children, and it's a, it's actually a beautiful bird. Now you'll also notice some are almost blood red, well more rusty red, and then some are kind of faint. The faint ones are the female, and the more colorful ones are the male. But effectively, they're monomorphic. They, uh, uh, yes, they're very close yeah, to being monomorphic. Be. But when you talk to birders, they uh, they'll give you the difference between the male and the female. Just ask right. me. So <laughs> that is. So you know, interestingly enough, it's amazing how quickly they have filled up the nest. And these birds are. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how long it takes before they fledge and leave the nest. But. Um, in, in one picture I had the, the one bird that is straight down, you can't see the beak. If the beak look, looks, looks more faded yellow, um, that bird at one point looked like it was almost trying to climb out of the nest. And um, it'll be interesting to see if one of these fledglings does uh, depart the nest, probably f to meet its maker, uh, you know, if it, if it can't, you know, move around on its own. Uh, but at least there's no, I've never seen any feral cats in this area. So um, there's no snakes that I've seen 
there. Uh, there's a big field north of us that probably some snakes in, but I don't oh, think I'm you'll, sure. I don't think you'll see any snakes make it this far into the parking lot looking for birds. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how this progresses in, yeah. in the next just, couple of days. Just yesterday we had a huge downpour here, so it yeah. makes me wonder, you know, how did those birds, those baby birds, survive that? With the, do you think that the robin was on top, the mother was on Mama, top? I went out. I went out and looked when I went home. Mama was sitting on the nest. So, on the nest yeah okay. and it it was it was a deluge it was it was a biblical proportions for about 30 minutes oh, it was and and right. i should and we have a radio tower east of us and i should have posted this picture of it there was two two people up there working on the tower and why they didn't come down because they could see it coming oh my god and we have these things called cell phones and they have radar and lightning alerts and this was one doozy of a thunderstorm. It was. And it started it raining and Tyler really saw stupid him. for them to be up there. And Jeez. one guy yeah, came I agree with that. One guy came down. The other guy was up at the very top and he just tried to ride it out for a while. And I, and after about, I don't know, probably 20 minutes of this constant fire hose caliber downpour, yeah. he finally starts climbing down. Oh, and, man. and I'm just gonna say he was one wet puppy, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, it's just he was That's crazy. Mad. So we'll we'll keep the nest watch on and do an update next week. And I think you're going to see an amazing change between June 29th, which is what two two days ago. I didn't take one yesterday morning because it was raining when I got to work, and I didn't want to disturb them that much. But mm-hmm. I think it'll be an amazing thing on next Wednesday to see how much or next Thursday how much they've progressed because in, in, in what, uh, 24th to the 29th, look at the change, you know, in just, you know, yeah. Five days. It's just astounding. Incredible. Incredible. So it'll be Uh, interesting. Ken, you've used the term monomorphic a few times. Are you saying that the male and female look the same or the same size or what do you mean by that? Monomorphic is a term that Dan was telling us about that means they look alike they right? look like okay that, so so like um uh, bald eagles are monomorphic their size difference but so the male and female both look like look the same uh, or same no, no, that would not be an appropriate uh is definition it not? for monomorphic okay. monomorphic is like is like a starling you'll see either three of them fly or three 30,000 of them flying, they all look alike because they're all monomorphic, both males and females. But with bald eagles, I mean, the bald, the male bald eagle gets a white head. But yeah. The female do not. Okay. Wait a minute. No, females can. Females do. Yeah, right. They, they are, but, but, but they don't show it until the fifth year. So you really can't tell when they're, when they're, you know, from birth to four years, you know, I'm not going to see yeah. the white head. So we Forget do have some. For adding that, uh, can't, but. They are monomorphic when they're adults. Okay. But, but again, as Dan pointed out, there are differences in the coloration of the breast. So uh, there are ways to potentially tell the males and the females apart. So Hmm. I'm assuming this is a female uh, because she's sitting on the nest. Um, I have not, I should have done research. I'll do research for next week and find out if in fact um, male robins are also nest sitters or not um you know and and that's that's what's cool about this journey be curious look it up we have never had more information available at our fingertips and when you have the question just stop and look it up and add it to your bank of of knowledge so or ask the question on the show and we'll find it for you ask questions on the show and we'll look them up for you yeah um Speaking of people watching the show, uh, we have uh, Richard Grace, who was the first to sign on. Cameron Gillis is watching from Cam Astronomy. Gary Alban, um, Book Davies, I think Book really likes uh, observing birds. Harold Locks is top of the afternoon. Kent Scott and Dan. Um, I mentioned Mike Wiesner is watching. He said that they got a lot of rain too, uh, almost an inch of rain yesterday in a couple of hours. Um, Let's see. Norm Hughes is there. Um, looking at Wallace, Ron, Ronald Delvaux. Yeah. How you doing? 
Ron. Uh, and um, any questions in particular about birds? Uh, Martin says, Martin Eastburn says, here I am looking at some nice birds now. So, um, Norm Houston, pictures. they got six inches of rain just today. Jeez. Norm's in Oklahoma, as I recall, I think. Uh, um, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, Gary Alban says, by the way, on the way to Kennedy Space Center's main entrance, there was a huge American bald eagle's nest. A wheel, and it, I don't know if it's the next it, next week or the week after, but we have a uh, uh, the it's in flight. I think is the name of the session of the episode, and uh, it's birds in flight. And one of the pictures I chose was a uh, bird eagle, a bird eagle, a bald eagle uh, <laughs> coming in for a landing on its nest. And we, since we know how big the wingspan is, it gives you an idea of how how big these nests really, really are. Um, right. And if I remember that bald eagle's nest has been there for years and years. Uh, and the longer it's there, the bigger it gets. But, you know, I, I look at this picture of, of, of these day old, two day old, three day old chicks. And, and, and it's just absolutely fascinating how that Robin has woven that little cup shape Innately, I mean, her yeah, mama. We should did, do a show just about nests alone. Her, you know, her I think mama, that would be very cool. Her mama didn't teach her how to do it. She just innately knew how she, he know how to do that. No one taught them, no parent taught them how to do that. It's just an innate skill. And it just is it, fascinating. And, you know, Scott, before next year, I want to figure out a way to put a camera up in, in this tree and do a yeah we have some things called action cams you know that yeah, i know but figure out a way to go into time lapse figure out a way to stream it live to the internet with a power supply we can change without disturbing the nest we, we got to work on this and you know you see bald eagle nests uh, are streamed a lot but i think it'd be cool just to stream a robin's nest you know just to do something that's a ubiquitous bird not a, not a, not a benchmark glory bird like a bald eagle Mm -hmm. I have a Sorry. contrast for you. Find a find a hummingbird nest, and the, the size of the nest is about a, a fifty cent piece. That's and aren't, it. Aren't they yeah. like or aren't are are they woven or are they like an Oreo nest? I can't no, remember. No, no, they are woven. Um, and as the adult sits on the nest, the tail hangs out the back, mm -hmm. and the, the long bill hangs out the front. And the the, the 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 nucleus of the body keeps the the, the, the eggs warm. Yeah. It's just, fascinating. Yeah, you know, and, and it's just uh, just watching these babies grow and document it. You know, I've I've had nests that I've watched before, but documenting the changes photographically is really, you know, increasing my just absolute wonder uh, of, of of how nature. much of nature, <laughs> just how life wants to exist you know just innately innate knowledge that just happens you know it's just uh, fascinating to me so uh it's 441 moving on to our last pretty picture this is a monarch on a cone flower that terry stanfield got um you know terry likes a lot of pretty stuff and i just you know, this is, this is something on the, you know, it's, it's on, it's flying. It's not a bird, but still pretty. And uh, I got a picture coming up at some point with some almost microscopic little flying things on a flower and just spectacularly beautiful. So that's the end of my show. I'll stop sharing end of your my show. show. <laughs> well, I uh, didn't, we didn't see it. You weren't sharing your screen. The screen share didn't happen. No, no. no. You want to share it? Wonder, hang on a second. PowerPoint shut down. Oh, well, that'll do it. That will do it. So let me get this. Yeah, Dan, you mentioned something about the nucleus over over the eggs. I, I like to have some nucleus with my eggs, too, in the morning. Well, Scott, we all have our excitement. Or is that Nutella? I don't know what it is. No, Nutella. <laughs> 
Oh man. Okay, working on this. I'm getting back there. Okay. Yeah, so. Chris Larson says I think we need to explore scientific game cams. We've got some. We do. <laughs> we the, should the, show the, some of the stuff that we have. It's pretty cool. The, the, I will pull that up. I, it's mostly animals, but okay. Are you seeing it now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Monarch butterfly on coneflower. Nice. So beautiful. Just you know, monarchs are ubiquitous. Everybody recognizes the monarch. Um, you know, and the tiger swallowtail is probably second. So anyway, there's Terry's closing picture for the show. You know, the game cameras we have are still pictures. They're not video cameras. And so that presents some problem, you know, getting, you know, ongoing pictures of birds. Uh, we do have, okay, we also have uh, bird feeder cameras. I will pull some bird feeder cameras, pictures that we've got. Um, the model is out of production. We're re-engineering it, but yeah. um, trying to make some improvements and, and make it make it more user-friendly. Um, but, you know, it's got a zone focus of three inches in front of the lens. And yeah. so it's got a tray you know, with a camera here and the birds land on the perch and they trip the shutter and it takes pictures. Um, and uh, we have some, you know, pretty nice pictures that we've taken and people have taken over the years. Uh, uh -huh. So I'll try and I'll put some of those up because I hadn't thought about that as a source as well. But we do have some pictures that are pretty cool. Um, in fact, we can show a video that uh, we have as well next week. So I may add that. To, I will add that to the slideshow and produce that. So cool. uh, that's a Okay, so some yeah. other shows that people I think might be interested in as well. I mean, there was a lot of mention about hummingbirds, a lot of mention uh, in the chats about owls, you know, as being we one have, of the favorite we birds. Have, so. we've, we've, we showed the ruby-throated already, I think, which is the predominant picture people take because they're so obvious. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of owl pictures I can put together. In fact, they will be a show one day. Um, so... I can tell you what's coming up uh, on the wing is next week. Uh, I mean, okay. excuse me. Woodpeckers is next week. And then uh, in flight is the week after that. And so those mm -hmm. are the ones I have finished. I've got some more underway and, and we'll talk about those next week. So next week is woodpeckers. And after that is uh, birds in flight and the birds in flight have just some spectacular pictures. Yeah. I think I saw the biggest woodpecker I've ever seen uh, here in Arkansas. I mean, this thing was, it was huge. I didn't know woodpeckers could get so big. Uh, but had, um, Probably had to be a pileated woodpecker. Pileated, pileated. Red color, you know. Um, big red crest. Yes. Yeah, big red yeah. crest. And uh, I don't, I don't know. This thing looked like, I mean, I had no way of really telling exactly how big it was, but I think it was over 15 inches long. I mean, it was just giant. You, you know? know, the, the, the ivory billed woodpecker, which has continued to be potentially extinct, um, was, uh, oh, it's been uh, 10, 12 years ago. Now a guy got a couple of seconds of video that, uh, Cornell lab people analyzed and decided mm -hmm. it, it in fact was a uh, what's also known as the Lord God bird because it is such a magnificent bird. But look up ivory billed woodpecker, and there's a uh, that's, yeah, that story has been around. And uh, based on what I know, that's never been proven actually. Right, and um, they there's a very distinct double knock sound they make, if I remember correctly, and they put audio traps all over the, what's called the big woods along the white river. And it was in swamp areas. It was, the water was up to your chest. I heard stories about it, but by the way, the pileated, by the way, is 16 and a half inches tall, Scott. Okay. All right. So I was pretty accurate. You know, I was just going to, I was aghast at how big this thing was, you know, and they're very vocal and very noisy. We also will be having them potentially next week, not to give anything away. But they, you know, it's a woodpecker and we do have a woodpecker show coming up. So never know what's going to be in there. You never know. Maybe we bring back the ivory-billed woodpecker. You That'd know, be nice. 
Um, it, it would be nice if, if in fact, the ivory billed woodpecker was not extinct, but habitat destruction. Um, there were some, the last confirmed sighting, if I remember correctly, was back in the 50s or yeah. 60s in Cuba, if I remember correctly. Um, and since then, there's not been a confirmed sighting. And, you know, there in East Arkansas, there was a whole tourist industry sprang up because of that video. Of, uh, Is this the video? Uh, let me share my screen here. It's, he was canoeing and he happened to have his camera turned on. No, that's a pileated woodpecker. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, his question, is this an ivory-billed woodpecker? No. Nope. Google ivory-billed woodpecker and you'll see the difference. Well, if he would stop shaking, maybe we could see what the bird actually looks like. Anyways, it's like sighting Bigfoot, I guess. Uh, it is. Um, <laughs> the ivory build is 19 and a half inches long, so it's three inches longer than the uh, pileated. So here's a picture. If I can get it up, I'll also known as the Holy Grail bird, the Lord God bird. Um, so why did, it, why did it go extinct? What, habitat. What habitat I destruction. Wow. Yeah. That's Which is bad. what the answer is. Um, there, there is a new feature to Google Earth where they show the, um, uh, I think it, it's, um, if you uh, search for Google Earth time lapse, and you're able to go into any part of the world and see a time lapse of how that region has changed over the years. And uh, uh, it's it's pretty amazing, you know. So you see cities expanding. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure if we went into the rainforest, we'd see it being destroyed. Uh, those kinds of things. But uh, it puts things in perspective, you know. And if you're, you know, if you're a wild animal, uh, you know, uh, certainly um, seeing your habitat um, diminish like that is. Um, is very tough. And, and so, you know, uh, it makes me wonder how, how humans will um, work, you know, towards the future of sustaining wildlife and, um, and bringing them back from the brink. So, so here's a, here's a picture from two stuffed taxidermy, I guess, technically two taxidermy specimens in the Florida museum. Um, I know, see. But there are distinct differences between it and the pileated. Um, but, you know, I was re like I said, was reading about um, the, uh, the migration of birds. And previously they, they tried to do counts listening to the, the sounds of the birds, uh, you know, that were flying at night and, and people who could identify all the birds would estimate bird estimates. But because of the radar, they can literally count the birds per cubic kilometer. And they also have discovered that uh, birds fly as much as 10,000 feet, feet above ground level in the central United States on migrations. And they take off anywhere from 30 minutes to three hours after dusk and land uh, as uh, come down and land as uh, uh, the sun begins to rise. And by sunrise, most of the birds have quit flying. And there's some really cool grass and stuff. And frankly, I think I'm going to do a whole episode on it because I find it so fascinating looking at the pictures and the maps and what they've done. It's a field that's now called aeroecology, as in the ecology of air. And hmm. you, you, we don't, you know, I never thought about the air as being its own habitat, but if you're a bird, Air is, you know, the, the air is habitat. And I, previous to this, always thought about habitat as the ground and the trees and, you know, the water. But, you know, look at albatrosses. They fly for three, four years before they return to, to land to mate. You know, their, their habitat in, in, for years is nothing but air. And there's a whole new field of study developing. But I just... I'm fascinated by that uh, and how we're using modern technology 
to try and tell cities and you know highly lit up places um, about light pollution. And this is just another way that light, we're finding out light pollution is affecting all sorts of things in ways we never thought of. And light pollution is just in many instances, is so simple as mm-hmm. don't shine light up in the sky. You know, don't leave buildings lit up all night long for no reason. Right. Um, you know, there's many buildings in cities. Yeah. Plus it raises your electric bill, right? It, I mean, it, the, the single biggest recurring expense in, in an office building is the lighting and air and climate control, you know, basically electric consumption. Mm. And, you know, uh, there is a large trucking company that I won't name that's located in Northwest Arkansas that leaves the lights in their entire building on all night long. And there's nobody on those floors, but yet they leave it lit up. And I think that's a function of LEDs that maybe are so inexpensive to operate that they go, ah, who cares? You know, leave it on all night long. And I don't know, it just strikes me as, you know, interesting. And, and, and I had a conversation over the weekend with some kids that, you know, we've all said it as parents and they've all heard it. Turn the light off. You're wasting electricity. Sure. Well, that, that doesn't carry much weight. I mean, that big deal. We're wasting electricity. But that 100 light, light bulb over the course of a day uses a pound of energy produced by burning a pound of coal, according to AEP. So in a year, that's 365 pounds of coal. So getting the calculator out, 365 times five, in five years, that's 1,825 pounds in five years. Of coal. So so literally in six years, that light bulb burned one ton of coal if you leave it on all the time. That has a, I mean, that gives people a concrete way to, to fathom it and I've always wanted to get a pound of coal. Just one light bulb, right? Yeah. I always, get, I always wanted to get a pound of coal and say, this kept that light burning for a day, you know, as an example of, of a concrete example. But if that light fixture is, is, is using X amount of electricity and half of it is going up in the sky, then it's using twice the electricity it needs to get this if you're happy with the light on the ground. So, you know, this is for me personally, I got involved in light pollution because of astronomy, but I'm now becoming much better adept at talking and and I'm going to integrate this in the speeches I give about migrating birds and how it disrupts them. We've all heard about the turtles crawling towards the bar, bars along the coast versus crawling towards the, the, the full moon rising over the ocean. Uh, but this is you know, just like, a, like to go get a, a cocktail bar. Yeah. It's like the, yeah. You know, the beaches along Florida now turn out all their lights during the hatching season and uh, work hard to keep the, the hatchlings going into the ocean versus crawling up the beach, trying to get to the bright light, which in this case is. Okay. It's not to get a stiff drink, right? No, it's not. No. Turtle, they're too young to drink. They're too young. That's correct. So, oh man, right, yeah, well, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. It's an easily solved problem, and uh, you know, but we got to get everyone behind it. So, yeah, you know, because each of us have our own reason to not to fight against light pollution. For astronomers, it's the ability to see the stars at night. For bird watchers. It's the ability to keep birds from from becoming disoriented yep. and destroy their migration routes. And um, for just human beings in general, it's just so the, the survival of our own species. Yeah. So. yeah. so anyway, all right, enough preaching about light pollution for yes. the moment anyway. Right. So. All right. Well, I do appreciate everybody watching today. Um, uh, Pekka wanted to know why all of the large birds are in uh in the americas so i don't know there's, if we can answer for that there's plenty of large birds in africa uh i know there's storks in germany i would think there would be storks in scandinavia as well that are very in fact you know the storks you know delivering babies came out of germany so 
right? Uh, there are so some someone large... did mention deforestation from World War II and World War One, so yeah. that could have that could have affected Europe dramatically. Yep. Yeah, you know, but there's there's large patches in France and Belgium, if I remember, that are so heavily mined that there it's a it's a forbidden zone, you know, because you know you go in there and you 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 get blown up, you come back missing a limb or whatever. Um, so you know mines and unexploded ordnance are a problem around the globe but to see the deforestation that's going on in in in, in the heart of brazil is astounding uh, what's going on and you know we we can't talk we we've, we've caused plenty of deforestation here in the united states um, well just here's here's that time lapse uh of uh, the Google time lapse just of Springdale, Arkansas. And you can see just over a few years, the growth of this little city. Yeah, it's, what, when did that start? Does it say when it starts? Yeah, it does. Uh, it starts like uh, 2000, oh, there it is. oh, 1980 or something like that. It's saying down there at the bottom, it's got a countdown. Let's watch it. Yeah. 1984. Is that right? 84 is what it said. Yeah. 84. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 and you know, it's just, it's not, it, we, people have to live places, you know, and every, every, Newton's laws apply to many things other than physics, you know, you either build out or you build up. If you build up, that creates different problems than if you build out. I asked the people in Miami whose building collapsed, and I'm not making light of that terrible situation, but, you know, it, whatever happened caused, you know, it'll be interesting to see the engineering reports from that. But when you build up, you, you've got to have elevators, and, you know, uh, you, you have collapses, and you're living in a very tight quarters with other people. I had a customer that I talked to in May, was it May or June, um, had not been out of his apartment in New York City since like March the 14th. Literally had not been in the hallway and everything they needed, they had delivered. And he waited um, like 30 minutes after it was dropped off outside his door and then went out with a mask on and disinfected everything. And he had two little kids under like, like three and two or something like that. And I can't imagine, you know, living March, April, May, June, July in the same, you know, tiny New York city apartment. That's just, that's just astounding what everybody it's went through. Undoubtedly in those cities. Be a lot of stories that are going to come out, um, as we emerge more out of this pandemic, but um, yeah, well, that that concludes. I think our our show. We're kind of digressing here a little bit, um, uh, but I think the focus on uh, birding is a good one, and uh, you know, uh, support support your local uh, uh, birding chapters. Uh, you know, join the uh, Audubon Society. Um, look into the Cornell Ornithology. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, organization. Uh, there's also the American Birding or, uh, Association that Dan George uh, loves so much. So, um, and there's there's organizations around the world, and they are doing things to help uh, support uh, uh, birds and birds mi bird migrations and bird habitats. And uh, just by joining, you're helping. So, and share, like, and share these videos. Go on yep. to YouTube and yeah, share them, awareness. like them. You know, spread, spread the word about what we're doing for yep. sure. All right. Okay. So uh, we will see you tomorrow. We've got our uh, focus on astrophotography program. I'm going to postpone the, uh, uh, the microscopy program as I, you know, I'm on the search for a, uh, a biologist um, that we can interview. Uh, so if anyone has any, uh, uh, you know, connections in that way, please let me know. Um, but uh, until that time, you guys uh, uh, keep looking up at the birds. <laughs> so, Dan, thank you so much. And uh, Ken, thanks for putting together that, uh, those programs. Yep.
And so send a thanks to that guy in, in Arkansas who's making all those great uh, birding photos. And, um, you know, I've, yeah. got, I've got Sheldon's phone number, so I'll give him a buzz and let him know how it's going. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.